Everybody cool? You guys ready to, to get back to talking about some MPAs for a little bit? Okay. Um, before we before we get to the next uh, subtopic in the MPA, we, we, we didn't finish the, we have a little bit left of the last sort of overview theory um, talk. And so I just wanted to finish that up real quick before we go on to the next uh, sub uh, category. And, uh, and we were talking about how big should a reserve be, et cetera. Um, some, of the rule, some of the rules of thumb that we would, uh, that have emerged over the last few decades of doing this is um, uh, the, closer, the closer and the shallower we are, generally the smaller we can get by, uh, the, we can get by with smaller reserves, generally speaking. Um, uh, and that's for a couple reasons, but one, because as we get in close tight, we tend to have a seagrass bed and a rocky reef and, or, or, or we might have a seagrass bed and a rocky reef and a this and a that in close proximity. Whereas when we're far, farther away, deeper, those things tend to be broader, more homogeneous, and it's harder to encapsulate the diversity in those things. Um, as we go farther offshore, um, the number of, of reserves, that, of MPAs that we tend to need in a network tend to go down, but any one individual uh, MPA tends to need to be bigger because of, those tend to be more wider ranging organisms. Think of like tuna and things of that nature as opposed to, you know, the near shore might be a barnacle or, a, or an urchin or something like that. Um, and then uh, while this is still on the, on the on the horizon, this idea of establishing marine protected areas in the open sea associated with some of the oceanographic phenomenon like a gyre, that is, that is still you know, conceptual and proposed at this point, but those would be, those would be a some type of dynamic MPA. So it wouldn't be like the, the offshore and the nearshore, it would be something that would be variable over time, be, be variable in location, be variable in width, all that kind of jazz. And so that's, yeah, that's just a, a, a theoretical thing at this point. Um, another key aspect, a, a key a theory uh, or, or aspect of an MPA network is do they help us get fish outside of our protected area, right? If, if our goal is fisheries management, do we, are we able to augment the fishery populations uh, outside? And so this is some of my PhD work. This is a kelp bass on the left. Um, this is the most common fish landed in Southern California recreationally. Um, uh, very, very abundant, very, uh, 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 can be quite big, but numerous schools. This is an experiment I did. So I built this reef on the right uh, and floated uh, uh, basically a big giant umbrella like the size of the room underwater. And um, in this case, it's really, really clear. So before, this is over Sandy Bottom off of Catalina Island. And before I put this up, there were very few fish in the water. If I took a picture beforehand, it would just be like blue, right? Put this thing up and within a few minutes, this is what happened. So what we see is, in this case, the fish are reacting to the spatial uh, influence of this structure. In this case, it was a shade, and, and they're, they're digging the low light. And so we see that that happens when we put up a dock or, a, or maybe a boat ties up, something of that nature. But it's really amazing that I've seen fish do this in the, on the edge of an MPA in the middle of a reef where there's nothing overhead, um, when we, when we it's, it's like the fish know where the line is. It's kind of weird. Even a fish like this, it's highly mobile. They can cruise over there, cruise over there. So um, there really is this idea of in versus out of a particular management um, unit. And so here's some data um, from some different examples. This one on the left is, is uh, uh, algae. The one on the right are fish. And what these guys show is, is the, the graph, the X axes are start of the MPA. And as we go to the right on the figure, we're going through time. 
time after establishment of the protected area unit. And we see a couple different patterns here. So the answer is everything, the, the variable, in this case, this is density, the number of individuals attached to the bottom per, per unit area. On this variable, it's the total amount of biomass uh, per unit area of fish. And we, talk, we mentioned before, but I'll just say it again, that that's a lot of the ways we measure fish. As we don't talk about number of fish, we talk about fish biomass. We talk about the total weight of them if we were to put them out of the, pull them out of the water and put them on a scale. Okay, and so all of these start off at a low condition and end up at a high condition, right? Low condition, end up at a high. But there's some different patterns here, right? So, so the first thing to say is they all got better. So, so um, the reserves were all uh, 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 produced um, fish, uh, uh, more, more fish or more organisms. But some of them, check it out, some of them are like pretty much consistent, Rink, right? Pretty much, more or less, this blue started and was pretty, pretty consistent increase. This blue was pretty much a consistent increase, 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 right? Um, but in the case of this uh, flapjack, uh, it, it did increase, but not very much for a long time. And it took a long time till it hit some critical threshold, and then it increased, right? Uh, and a similar pattern here with the parrotfish. They, they kind of didn't do much initially, and they did a lot, and they kind of hit a stable condition, right? So what this is telling us is that in some conditions, uh, uh, our, fish, our extraction or our, our impact on those critters was pretty darn hard. And as we've released that, in this case, exploitation pressure, harvest pressure, they're responding by, by growing, by expanding, by 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 getting bigger in terms of the population, right? Um, in other cases, there's some condition that, and so the, some condition that needs to be met. And so maybe it's number of mates, maybe it's the right oceanographic condition. And so it might take a certain amount of time before they can fully uh, expand. So what that's gonna say is if we try to look at the yield of, you know, did this MPA work? And, we, and for a species like this blue species, Maybe it totally makes sense to look five years out and say, hey, do we have more algae outside the reserve versus inside at five years? That's a, maybe a fair thing to say. But in other cases, because of the biology or the, or the oceanographic conditions, maybe we need more like 10 years to sort of evaluate that question. Maybe, we, maybe it's not fair to say, hey, we're going to do this, and the, and the fishermen say, well, I better see more fish in five years, or I'm going to, you know... <laughs> not support this thing or whatever, right? We want we need to make sure that we're going into this with realistic uh, 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 benchmarks and targets and things. Okay, one of the clearest pieces of evidence that we have this spillover effect uh, is where fishermen fish. So this is George's Banks. This is um, a famous example of crappy management. This is one of the reasons why people came to North America, right, was to get the cod um, and the fish stocks off of sort of the New England coastline, the sort of, you know, the Atlantic off of Canada, off of New England, that area. So back in the day, we didn't have refrigerators. So one of the ways we were able to store protein was to uh, salt meat, and one of the most popular ones was, was fish, and in particular cod, so salted cod was like, uh, was, was like a power bar kind of thing back in the day, right? Um, and so, so we fished these areas for millennia, and then, you're welcome, we destroyed them uh, about, 20 year, about 30 years ago. We, we drove them to um, near extinction. Um, and so then we enacted a series of marine protected areas after we totally hammered them. And that's what we're looking at. So we're looking at, so here you see Cape Cod, here, the, the classic, right, this classic shape right here of the, of the East Coast. <clears throat> and what am I looking at? I'm looking at transponder data from fishing vessels. And so this is a heat map of transponder data. The transponder data tends to be pretty real. One, note, we're inside the US exclusive economic zone. So we have pretty strong rules. You can't just flick off your, 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 your transponder. But also, has anybody seen um, uh, what the hell, what's, what's the movie, um, um, 
Perfect Storm? Yeah, well, that's because you guys are you guys are so young. So, um, so yeah, so the perfect storm is is about so George Clooney. These guys are fishermen, and they're going out, and it's I'll just say it doesn't end well. Uh, I won't tell you what happens in the movie, but it doesn't end well. Um, and it's a hard place. It's it's a it's a rough sea where we're mapping here, right? So these folks use transponders to also say where they are. So if their ship goes down in rough seas, the Coast Guard and people know where they are. So there's a there's a built-in incentive to not turn it off. One, two, some of, this fish, some of this fishing is happening in a corporate context. So those corporate owners want to know where their fishing boat is. They don't want it to just flick off, right? So we're not talking coke smugglers here or you know, human traffickers that are trying to hide. These are people that there's, there's an there's a economic incentive and there's a save my life incentive to have their transponders on. So for all, the, all that to say, we can pretty much trust this data. This is pretty good data. There's probably not a lot of lying going on in this system as to where the vessels are. Okay, and so what I'm showing you here is what you guys recognize is a heat map, right? And so each of these little pixels is a, a point, is a, is, a, is, a, is a grid mark in space, and the hotter the color, the more we have a vessel reporting its location there, right? And so what this is showing is every time the vessel is traveling less than 3.5 knots. And so that's the speed at which they're going to be towing nets behind them. If they're going faster than that, they can't, they can't effectively do the fishing. So if they're less than this, they're potentially fishing. Okay. And so um, what am I looking at? So yeah, well, let me ask you guys. So what do we see here? What, 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 what's a takeaway you get from this? Yes, yes. So, so the MPA color has been added here, but even if I didn't have that MPA color, you would see something weird, right? You would see this shape carved out of this. Now, occasionally there's, there's a boat that's in here that's going less than 3.5. I don't know, maybe they're, maybe they're fishing. That's, that's totally possible. Maybe they're just, I don't know, changing their gas tank or something, right? So we, so we, don't, we don't know the activity. But the vast, vast, vast majority of time that people are spending moving less than 3.5 knots is what we call on the line. This is called fishing the line. So people are going right up to the edge of the protected area, and that's where they're doing their exploitation. So they're acknowledging that if I go in there, that's illegal, or that's wrong, or that's bad, or, or we've come to an agreement, but outside is cool. And I could be anywhere. So these guys are out here, right? So there's maybe some seamount or something here. A lot of these folks, this one too, these, these folks kind of like that. But what they really, really like, the hottest of the hot, the reddest of the red, is right up, you know, a meter away or 100 feet away from, from that area. If they weren't catching fish, they would not be there. They would not be there. So this, this tells us that, yes, this is, this, they're, the fishermen see value in being right next to this. And that tells me that dudes are coming out of that area. So that's a positive sign, right? That's what we want to see happen. Okay. Um, uh, generally speaking, what we've seen with MPAs is that fishery catches increase all the time. They increase within the reserve all the time. But, or the fishery populations, but they don't necessarily always spill over. Um, I would say there's, there's, there's a bit of a confounding issue, especially early on in the establishment of the MPA, and I want you guys to know this. So this is maybe a great example for a, te or a quiz question, right? And so that is, we establish this area, we establish this area right here, and fish can't, or, and we can't, we don't fish there. This right here, my, my experiment from when I was much younger and had more hair, I didn't, I didn't make any, I didn't grow any fish. None of these fish grew because I had an MPA. I put this up and the fish had a behavioral, behavioral, oh, Jesus. They had a behavior that responded to what I did, okay? In real time, none, these are no, no babies were born. No fish mated and grew into an adult between when I put these up and took this picture, right? So, so this is the fish choosing in real time to move to a safe area or an area that is desirous to them for some reason. And again, especially with these guys, 
they can seem to smell when people are fishing, right? And they will, and they, they will seem to go away from where people are fishing. Um, and so we have this difference between attraction. So what I just did attracted fish from the area. And they said, hey, I'm going to not be over where Isabel is. I'm going to come over to me. Okay, that's attraction. Um, and you can also call that hiding from the, the fishing pressure. But what we really want to see is we really want to see production, right? We really don't want to see re reallocating folks on the reef. We really want to see making, adding new individuals to the reef. And that's production. And that will happen, but that takes time. And so, so in some of the early debates about d does, do MPAs yield you know, stuff outside the reserve, um, th this gets confounded. So initially that might suppress fish yields outside, right? If all the fish run away from where the fishermen are and they run into the reserve initially, that might be um, worse than not having, you know, from the fishermen's perspective, you know, a bad thing to start with. So just realize we have this difference. Between, so, so attraction and production can initially be confusing and we can't, we don't necessarily have an easy way to de determine to those two things in the real world most of the time. Um, on Santa Cruz Island during lobster season, those guys put their uh, traps. traps right on the NPA line. Right exactly. And, uh, and I don't know if Isabel and Soraya saw this, but when we were out in Santa Rosa last weekend, they, they were just starting, the lobster season just opened, and they were putting their lobster traps just outside the MPA. Right on the line. They know yeah. exactly yeah. where um, So, but I'd say even when we have places that, that don't initially have a strong spillover signal, what we do see is that Reserves tend to reduce the variability of the fishing efforts outside of the reserve. And they, another way of saying that is also they increase the long-term stability. So they might not, we might not have a, a massive increase, you know, but it doesn't get any worse. It definitely doesn't get any worse. And stuff tends to stabilize. We hope that it expands and grows and gives them more food options, more income options but it doesn't make things worse, uh, uh, you know, in most cases. Um, uh, generally speaking, when we add a reserve, yeah, right. Uh, did you see any different like, effects within like, different weather patterns? Because I know like, this year there's been a lot more droughts than the water's been colder. Oh, sure. And sure. So, so Ryan's question is, hey, so, so in uh, inter-year variability, or, you know, you know, so this year it's really good for this condition or it's really bad for that condition or it was a poor recruitment year for the snails or, you know, whatever. So absolutely. So that's why we, we need to look at these patterns over time and sort of understand that there's always going to be up, there's always going to be down. But we're talking about the overall trend, the overall trend over multiple sampling frames, over multiple sampling years. But good question. Good question. Eddie. Oh, this one? Yeah. This one? Yeah, yeah. How do you know that uh, those MPAs aren't just, like, them fishing isn't just a product of the fish going up to that line instead of, like, the actual production of the MPA? Like, okay, so Eddie's question is, how do we know that, so they're fishing, they're fishing right here, so clearly there's fish there, but, he's, but his question is, maybe there's no fish in here. Maybe they all just don't like that area. And the answer is we monitor that. So we have, we have trawl, we have, so you can't do commercial fishing in there or recreational fishing, but the sign, but the fisheries monitoring folks go in and do, and do sampling. And so we know that there's fish there. So you wouldn't know that from this figure, good point, but I'll tell you there definitely are fish there. But if, that, if this is the only piece of evidence I give, gave you, that, that's, a, that's a possible critique. Good. Okay. Um, where was I? Okay, so um, uh, generally speaking, when we add a reserve, to a poorly managed fishery, it's gonna increase the catch over time. Maybe not the first year or two, but over time it'll increase um, the fishery. If we add, and this is important, this is another great quiz question. If we add an MPA to a well-managed fishery, it's gonna have the effect of reducing catch. Why? Because if, we, if we're doing a good job managing it, that's great. We're doing a good job. And by 
lock it by by putting a certain proportion of the fishing area out of bounds, by definition, we're not going to be able to catch as many fish, right? That might be a reason to do that for a, a conservation, uh, you know, a conservation motivation or something, or maybe we're doing shooting rockets off so we don't want people to be in the area for safety or something. But just realize um, that MPAs could reduce overall catch. That's not the norm. The norm. The norm is that we're not managing the fisheries properly or well, and so adding the MPA usually, in almost all cases, increases the catch over time. So, so that's for catch over time. But in both scenarios of adding the risk of poorly managed and then well managed, it increases fish just difference amounts, right? Uh, y yes, yes. So, the, but then the idea would be, sure. The idea would be though that the the well managed population um, we're, we're taking pieces off the table yeah. that, that, aren't, that aren't possible to exploit. So that's why, yeah. Good. Um, okay, and then I'll just hit this real quick and then I wanna get to the, to the this, this will wrap up this section. Um, I'll just say that um, there's been a lot of talk, uh, at least historically. Um, we, we, we have some, start, okay, on, on land, we pretty much have to start, if we want to add protected areas in a protected area network, we pretty much have to start with whatever we have, we've inherited, for better or worse, right? Yes, we maybe did this because it was the unsexy place, was the ugly place, was the top of the mountain that we couldn't exploit, you know, and that, that those are sort of the protected areas we're starting with. Because of the legal framework of, of you know, who owns land and you can't take land away and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very, very difficult to acquire new areas. We went to the MRCA property and heard some of the trials and tribulations of trying to acquire new parcels in the terrestrial world. It's possible, but it's, it's like opportunistic, catch as catch can, right? And so that's led people to ask, hey, can we build a really kick butt network, protected area network using the existing uh, protected areas, right? In the ocean, there is the possibility of doing that, of using the existing number of reserves, or wiping them clean and starting off fresh, right? Now that might be politically hard, but legally that's actually a possibility that, that doesn't really exist in the same way on land. Um, and so the two scenarios then that you would have if you wanted to build a more robust, a new marine protected area network would either to be use your existing stuff or, um, or, uh, or, or, or delete everything and start over from scratch. And um, I'll just say that, that uh, I'll just say that um, in most cases, it's better to, um, uh, it's most efficient to start over from scratch, but that it can be okay to use the existing networks. Don't want to spend much more time on that because that's not really a relevant thing for our class, but I'll just, I just want to mention that. And you'll see this crop up where people have an existing network and then maybe there's a big push to do something new. They will have a debate whether they can use the existing framework or should just throw everything out. Okay. All right.